My name is Jocelyn. I am a docent here at the Gibbon House Museum in Greenwich, New Jersey, and today I'm going to show you our new exhibit, 100 Years of Beauty, 1920 through 2020. So the goal for this exhibit was to showcase all of the cosmetic items that we have in our collection here at the Gibbon House Museum and to put them in a way where we can talk about how they were at the time, the history and significance of the items, as well as how they have changed throughout history. So to start with, over here, there is the talc powders and perfumes. These have a ranging of time. You can see in the center there, we kept all of the ones that are in the same brand. They are all palm olive in there. There's tin containers for them, glass. It changed throughout. There's even some cardboard ones back there. They would be used as a form of a deodorant, so that way they could have the scent through it. This was obviously much before we realized that talc is dangerous and shouldn't be used quite as much as it is. But we have a fairly significant collection here of the talc powders through time, which is very interesting because it gives us a good idea and example of all of the different ways that they were packaged and the different brands and how significantly important they were in the time that they were primarily used. There were so many kinds of brands, so many scents, so many methods. You can easily see that this was a very sought out item. Over here, what we wanted to do with this was this shows the evolution of print advertising for cosmetics through the 100 years of 1920 through 2020. We have up here in the top left corner, in 1920, there's a black and white image and you can see the subtleness of the makeup and it was just a very sophisticated ad. Then in 1930, we added some color to it. The eyebrows are thin. You can really see the style of the time through all of these. 1940, they're more so advertising their items in a larger scale. 1950 is actually a bit more of a painting rather than a real woman, which is interesting. The 60s, we added some more color into the eyes. The 70s is very much a 70s look of eyeshadow. You can see how it developed through there and they were promoting their eyeliner at the time. And then in the 1980s, they brought in celebrity to help endorse Maybelline. And this is Madonna. We all know who Madonna is. And she was promoting the items and that was putting an endorsement with her name attached to it to bring a little bit more of a buzz around it. In 1990, you can see that the makeup started getting darker and they were promoting different styles of looks. And you can really see the evolution of style. The one for 2000 is the only one we have that is a cover girl ad and not a Maybelline ad because we really wanted to showcase that Rihanna is on this one. So very similar to the 1980s, brands began using celebrities. In 2010, you can see they're advertising their mascara product. A very simplistic picture with just a bright light onto the face. And then in 2020, we now have an ad that was used in New York Fashion Week. So Maybelline has come all the way from this subtle black and white picture of a very beautiful young woman, all the way to these two supermodels modeling the eyeliner that they used in New York Fashion Week. So the print advertising has really come a long way. Print advertising is still used, as well as they use these same images in their online advertising as well. And then to move into the case here, we have a variety of items. These are our more so beauty makeup kind of items in our collection. And there are face powders back here. They're all ranging in brands and ranging in times. We have Kiss Proof Powder, Outdoor Girl Powder. You can see this larger box was actually a powder on top and there was a puff on the bottom and at the top as well. And it was just a very large way of packaging a face powder. Then we get the Colgate face powder called 17, which we really wanted to showcase that little quote that in 1930, they used the quote, all the witchery of youth captured in 17. I think this is a very important statement because makeup was very much linked to witchcraft and a lot of people believed that being able to change one's appearance like that was a sign of witchcraft. There was certain cultures that actually banned makeup and they did not trust it. So that was an important part that we really wanted to capture that that was truly the 30s, not so much. It was getting a little bit more normalized, but it was still a very 
significant idea that witchcraft and makeup were tied hand in hand. Up here, these face powders are a bit more luxury packaging. You can see that the way they're folded and they have wax seals on them and they're more concealed in a fabric. These were much more of a French style of face powder. They're from the 19, 1900 to, through 1930. One of these is from France, one of these is from Chicago, but they all have a similar luxurious feel to them and it was a specific way as opposed to the boxes we saw above them these were more of a luxurious way of packaging your face powder up here this is the brand henry tedlow it was made in philadelphia pennsylvania and it was established in 1849 we have two of his powders the blue moon powder and the pussy willow powder these were both very popular because henry tedlow was the first brand that started mass producing talc powder and when they began producing their face powders, it was hugely large in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, which we are very close to Philadelphia. So in this area, it is very likely that in this time, this would have been a number one face powder provider. Then to the right of that, we have the Princess Pat face powders from 1922. These are particularly interesting because of the design of them. You can see at the top, that is when they got the patent for the design. It is a box with almost a drawer mechanism to hold the powder in it. And it was just a very, almost like a jewelry box kind of way that it would be presented, which very much fit with the idea of Princess Pat, which the company was actually named after a princess. The paper that you see with the Princess Pat items is actually the same exact paper that was inside of that little box on top of the face powder when you slid out the drawer. Then right underneath of that, we have Air Slim Face Powder by the brand Cody. Now this is interesting because you see a glass bottle holding the powder as well as a compact refill, both from 1920. Then we put in here a version of it in, in 2020 with a plastic packaging and a big powder puff on top of it. This is the new way that it's presented. So it's interesting to see how small the compact refill is as opposed to how big the packaging is now. However, not much to the recipe has actually been changed in this product. So it's still a very loved product by makeup lovers, even in 2020, which that is a very strong statement and shows its test of time that it has withstood that well. Right next to that, to the left, we have the Curlene Pomade for Lash and Brows. This was between 1920 and 1930. This was, this design was through those 10 years. You can see that they show eyes on the packaging and it's a little green tube. Now this could have been used for, like it says, lash or brows. You would just have to put it on a little spoolie so that way you could use it on your lashes or just wipe it on your brows. It didn't come with that. It was just simply almost like a little tiny paint tube, which is interesting to think because now our products are so different from how that was. And above that, we have a Maybelline mascara from 1920 through 1930 as well. So while Curaline was coming out with the mascara that was in a tube that came out like paint, Maybelline was revolutionizing the mascara industry and they were coming out with an almost toothbrush-like device to brush onto a charcoal type of substance so that way it could be brushed onto the lashes. You can see that it comes in a nice little compact design and this one is actually, this is a, an original and you can see that it has some use to it, but it looks like you probably would have been able to get a lot of use out of it. The ad for it, the ad for it at the top is the same ad. It was just for a slightly different launch because it opened up instead of sliding out. But I think that was simply just a different packaging they came out with. You can see there's much more of a similarity to that form of mascara than to what we have now. Mascara here is a little spoolie that you just brush on your lashes, which is similar to the plastic spoolie we would use for our mascara now. But the difference is we would dip it into a liquid like the curling. So it's really, mascara has evolved to become quite a combination of the two ways that was popular at the time. Now, right here, we have a display on lipstick. This display is loaded with history, honestly. We can take it 
anywhere from some of the examples of modern lipstick shades, how it has evolved into the boldness of pinks and browns and purple, things and shades that nobody would have thought to put on their lips at that time because it would have been seen as far too bold. Here we have a true replica shade of the Elizabeth Arden Victory Red shade from 1941. And this one was purchased this year and it is from this year. This one is manufactured, but nobody is making the exact shade of Victory Red anymore besides this brand. They do it so that way it can be a recreation of it and still pay homage to the original shade of it. Up here, you can see some of the ads that they used. The big significant item here that really should be pointed out is that red lipstick originally, we go way back, red lipstick initially came out and it was very smeared on their lips and it was very common among Egyptian women. But then as it evolved, it became seen as wrong and it became seen as a social status. So there was a time where men truly believed that if they met a woman who was wearing red lipstick, they knew she was a prostitute and she was not to be courted, but you could have other motivations there, just not actual courting to actually find a wife. And if the woman did not have that kind of red lipstick and strong makeup, then yes, she could go and she could be your wife and she was a respectable woman. So that gives us kind of an idea on where people viewed red lipstick at the time. As time progressed, it remained true that red lipstick is a very strong statement. Adolf Hitler is quoted many times as saying that he absolutely despises red lipstick and he thinks that it is wrong for women to wear it. There was a time where Elizabeth Arden was giving her employees red lipstick tubes to hand out to the suffragettes that were protesting for women's rights to vote. The reasoning behind that is that they believed the red lipstick such a strong statement that it may have A, made men feel uncomfortable but respect them a little bit, and B, it would draw attention to your lips and therefore draw attention to the words coming out of them, which was a hugely important thing that we wanted to, that they wanted to get across because they wanted their voices to be heard. They wanted their votes to be heard. They wanted to have a voice and have a vote. So this was handed out to the protesters so that way they could wear it and they could all feel strong and empowered. In the war, red lipstick is actually a very significant item. There is a really strong tie to red lipstick and wars, which is an interesting idea that you might not have thought of. In World War II, because Adolf Hitler hated red lipstick, the women in the war began to wear them. Brands like Elizabeth Arden began to release shades like Victory Red to be a strong red, and it was specifically to promote military women. There was Montezuma Red, which was a specific red for the Marine Corps women, and it was a very strong message. As you can see in one of the ads here, there is a poster that says, Beauty as Duty, and it was a just a very strong idea. It was part of their very uniform. When these women put on their military uniform, they had to put on red lipstick. Absolutely part of their uniform. So that was a very important thing there. And then it began to become a thing at home as well. The women had to take over in factories and they had to go and work when the men could not work. So many of the factories always made sure that their bathrooms were fully stocked with new, brand new red lipsticks. And it was one of the few things women were and people were willing to splurge their money on was red lipstick. You would go into a factory and you would see these women getting completely dirty, but with their red lipstick because they felt as long as they could wear that and they could truly showcase their beauty, how they felt, that they were still making a point. It was also a very strongly common idea that by keeping red lipstick on and maintaining your beauty, it was what they owed the men overseas who were fighting for them. That was more so an idea among the men. The women, however, felt empowered by it and they loved that Adolf Hitler didn't like it and that military women were wearing it. So by wearing it in their simple jobs in a factory, they felt they were fighting for the bigger cause as well. Red lipstick has actually remained something very popular as times have changed. There was a rise up for the war, there was a rise when movie stars would wear it. But even that still, the sales may go down on red lipstick, but the highest, one of the highest sales of red lipsticks were, was right after 9-11 happened. It's 
almost a form of comfort and of power that you can still have control of something. There's numerous stories about women that are going into breast cancer surgeries or any other form of surgery and they wore red lipstick before their surgery because they felt that it gave them power going into it. There's a lot of articles that I find really interesting that are about the psychology of red lipstick and a lot of the psychology of red lipstick goes into you need to be confident to wear it because it's so bold but at the same time wearing it makes you confident so by wearing it even for example some studies have worn it for a week straight to see if anybody would treat them different and they've seen some results but that is also because they felt more confident they felt like i'm wearing bright red lipstick and this is a bold move of me while to us that may seem like it's a silly thing because oh it's only red lipstick, it truly does tie into psychology and it has since such an early time. It has been tied to power and to force and it is truly a significant part of history that really doesn't get enough attention as it should. Then beside it here we have the Bloodlust Artistry Palette by Jeffree Star Cosmetics. And this is the first ever hexagon shaped eyeshadow palette. This is the box that the palette comes in. And you can see the picture of the palette right above it as well as the CEO and founder of the company, internet personality, Jeffree Star. It sold out because it was new. It was coated in a crushed velvet and it was just something that you can see all of these old styles of makeup that we have next to here, something that None of the brands in this time making their small compacts with their powders and their eyeshadows and the revolutionizing of a small square box to put your powder in that slides out like a jewelry box. None of those brands would have imagined to be, to be making a large hexagon shaped eyeshadow palette. That is why we put that there because it is truly a significant point of how much things have changed and the strength that the beauty industry has now gained. Next to here, we have some items that were hair products and skin products. We wanted to include these because these are also part of beauty. This is a curling iron from 1880 through 1890. Next to those, we have some hair products from varying through the 10 years of 1930 to 1940. You can see there was hair dressing and there was hair grower and there was scalp and pressing oil. All of these items, many of them say that it's war packaging or they have the prices on them for the refills, which is also an interesting idea because now you'll very often not get your items refilled. It's just once you run out, you will simply run out. The facial items, you have facial soaps and beauty soaps as well as a shaving set. And then to the right here, we have a 19th century face screen. What is interesting to me about the face screens is that they would be used in front of a fireplace and you can lift it up to the size of the height of your face that you needed it to be. The purpose of this was so if a woman was being courted by a man and they were sitting across from each other at the couches by a fire, that would protect the heat from blaring onto her face to melt the makeup actually off of her face because the makeup in that time contained so much wax. This is also the reason why you often see in movies people holding their little fans and they'll fan their faces. It's because they're trying to keep the makeup from melting off of their face, essentially. So it's very interesting that that's how they protected their makeup when now we can simply spray a setting spray on our face and it should stay in place perfectly well. So that is our new exhibit, 100 Years of Beauty, 1920 through 2020. We do hope you will come out and actually see it for yourself once we can open back up for you. If you have any questions, please feel free to comment down below and we will answer them the best that we can. If you would like to see a closer video or more information about any specific item or product, please just let us know in the comments as well. We will be having many more exciting exhibit and item videos coming out for you during this time. And we hope that you all will enjoy them and you are all just as excited for them as we are. And if you don't want to miss them, you can hit the subscribe button and turn on the notification bell so that every time that we here at the Cumberland County Historical Society post a new video, you can get a notification so you can be sure that you don't miss it. Thank you so much for watching and we will see you in the next one.